Welcome to video lesson number three. In this lesson, we'll be looking at analyzing and drawing conclusions from graphs that we have created. Now, before we can get into that, let's take a quick look back at what we've already done. So far, we've addressed our problem, identified our variables uh, in our specific question here about our man going for a jog. After that, we created a data table and followed up with this graph. Now, we're going to be specifically looking at this graph and gathering some more information off of this graph as we move through this lesson. So let's first start off with looking at trend lines or lines of best fit. On this graph, I can add a line that shows me the general overall trend of the data. Now, this line right here is a relatively good trend line. You'll notice that it gets close to each of the points and it only really touches one point. We'll talk about some specifics as to things we should look for when creating a trend line in just a little bit. But now let's take a look at this second trend line. This trend line is what we classify as a poor trend line. This is because it only touches on two of the data points but also is very 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 far away from both this point and this point. So if it's too far away from those points, it's definitely not a good trend line. Let's take a look at this trend line. Now, again, this is another example of a poor trend line. And the reason for that is because now all of my data is below my trend line. Look at point number four here and point number two. They both actually exist beneath the trend line. So again, let's erase that one and let's put back in our really nice one there from our original look. Now, why is that a good trend line? Well, number one, not every point is on the line, right? Not every point needs to be on the line. and We should definitely, definitely, definitely not be connecting the dots when we are putting in our trend lines. When you connect the dots, it doesn't really mean anything for us, so we want to make sure that we're showing the overall trend. The second thing that is shown here is the fact that we have an equal number of points on both sides of the line. Now, yes, you're right, we have two above and one below, and then one down here at the origin. Well, that is the case, but I do have a distribution of points above the line and below the line. If I was to have five points here, I would do my you would want to do your best to get it to go between each of those five points. So again, we make the statement that we want to get as close to as many points as possible as we go through. This is the way it should be. All right? We're going to make mistakes as we make our way through. We're going to um, have less accurate data than um, would be ideal. So that's what's going, this is how we take that into account is by using this trend line. Now, we want to say what type of general relationship this is. And this is what we classify as a direct relationship. You'll notice that as I move across my x axis or my independent variable axis here, I have the same amount of growth in my dependent variable axis, meaning as I move across the x-axis each step along the way, the same vertical growth or y-axis growth occurs. So that'll be what we classify as a direct relationship. Now we'll look at trend curves where there's an exponential relationship and various other things uh, such as an indirect relationship further on down the line in the school year, but for right now this, shall, this should suffice. The next step that we need to do once we've put in our trend line is to begin to calculate the slope. Now the slope is one of the most important things that we can find on a graph and we can do that using really two different equations. This first equation is really the definition of slope and it's just the fact that we have rise over run. Now we can break that down a little bit further into y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. This version right here is going to be the one that we use most often. So let's begin by trying to identify some of our points that we can use. You'll notice my first point here and my second point don't necessarily 
fall directly on an intersection. While it would be absolutely perfectly ideal if they did fall on an intersection there or two grid lines, sometimes we do have to make some approximations or some estimations. So what I've tried to do here is find some easy places where I can make those estimations. You'll notice my first point is just a little bit under halfway, so I'm going to say that's about six. And you'll notice my second point here is uh, falls pretty neatly there on those grid lines, so I'll be able to use that as well. Now, you'll notice that they're spread rather far apart. We did that on purpose so that they cover as much of the data as possible. If I was to grab two pieces of information or two data points a little bit closer, you'll notice they're not quite as easy to approximate, but they don't necessarily encompass all of my data. I've tried, or you'll notice here, that between the two green points that I might have selected, I only have one data point inside that. So again, we want to do our best to include as much of the data as possible. Here you'll see I've got about three data points. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my coordinates, or my scale, to determine the coordinates of each point. So my first point is at 1, comma 6, and then the second point as is at 6.5, comma 45. So I have two sets of ordered pairs here. Now that I have my two sets of ordered pairs, I'm going to begin to calculate the slope. And once the way we calculate slope and we make any calculations in this class will be known as using the guess method. The first step is to write down what we know, the given. Point 1 had the order pairs of 1 comma 6 and point 2 had 6.5 comma 45. Our next step then is to put down our unknown. Our unknown here that we're trying to find is our slope. Third step is to write down the equation, slope, rise over run, and then to break it down into y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. Now, the first S in our acronym here is substitute. We want to make sure that we substitute in our, right, our correct pieces into the right spot. I substitute in the y value in the second point for y2, the x value for the second point for x2. And the same thing goes for y1 and x1. So you'll notice they are there. Now, you'll also notice that I included units. I included units here because even our slope has a specific unit, so we need to make sure that we include those units as we go through. Now, I can begin to reduce my pieces, 45 minus 6, and then 6.5 minus 1 will leave me with 39 meters over 5.5 centimeters, and then I have my solution, or I've solved to find that my slope of my line here is 7.09 meters divided by seconds, or meters per second. Now, what slope identifies for me here is the fact that it is actually its own physical quantity. We'll talk more about this physical quantity specifically as we move forward. So now that we've discussed the general relationship being direct, we've calculated the slope, we want to begin to look at how can we derive the exact relationship that is created. So to do that, we want to make sure that we understand or we can address how the independent, dependent, vari the independent and dependent variables and the slope are all related. Now we'll do this again by using our definition of slope. Now, if we remember back what we had on our rise axis or our y axis, that would be distance. And what we had on the run axis was time. So we are just going to substitute in the big picture pieces there. So I have our slope is equal to our distance divided by, by our time. Now we're going to do an, a mathematical operation known as cross multiplying. We're going to, to do that to make it just a little bit more visually understandable, we put that over 1 and then we cross multiply. So when I cross multiply, I multiply slope by time and I multiply distance by 1. So I have 1 times the distance is equal to the slope multiplied by 
the time. So if I then make another substitution, I'm left with distance is equal to 7.09 meters per second multiplied by the time. This is what we call deriving the exact relationship. So the exact relationship here is this statement right here. Now, yes, I understand that this is essentially equal to this. However, as you'll see in the next, or in this investigation and in, in our subsequent investigation, this is the easiest way to begin to look at it. So the final thing that we need to do is we need to then make some single sentence summary of what we've found. And in this instance, we'll have the distance of our person is running is the product of the time the person has been in motion and the rate at which the person is moving. And now that rate at which the person is moving is our slope. So this should say, if it was a little bit more specific, the distance a person runs is the product of the time the person has been in motion and the rate of 7.09 meters per second at which the person is moving. Now, all of these pieces end up listing either directly beneath your graph or on the following sheet of your graph if you're looking at submitting something. So now let's wrap things up here for our first three video lessons. We've first identified our variables, we've shown our set, we've learned how to collect data, how to display data, and then finally to how to analyze our data. So then really the last piece that we need is to make sure that we're asking our instructor any questions as they might come up along the way.